to everyone there. It's a pity you can't see the audience. Ed. Uh, they are as happy as they would be if you were here. Uh, so you're, you're obviously <laughs> next, not as happy as you would be. be there in person. <laughs> no, they're, they're very glad to, to see you, as am I. Uh, and I think you know, the, the, the extent to which uh, conversation between us has become easier and, and uh, more casual is an incredibly good sign, especially given the fact that I think there are significant forces uh, and well-funded forces that would rather you and I not have these conversations at all. Uh, you know, I, I think that's one of the, the big revelations of the last year is when this started, uh, none of us really had a full picture of what the government was doing, what they had uh, sort of entitled themselves to do without asking the public, without even asking the majority of Congress, instead only a few sort of uh, shadowy committees that make decisions behind closed doors, uh, private meetings, there's no press, there's no, there's no public advocate because these people uh, on the Intelligence Committee, they don't represent America, they represent the defense industry. Uh, and they, 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 as far as I can tell, they don't even represent the majority of people in intelligence. Yeah. <laughs> what, I would, uh, what I would say is we've seen sort of a growing appetite for control uh, among government institutions. And it's important to remember that this is not just an American problem. This is a global problem. This is something we're seeing around the world where basically programs uh, and surveillance, the way law enforcement works in the wake of these terrorist events, is they've changed the model. You know, the, the game has changed from where law enforcement investigates criminals, uh, where intelligence agencies in, investigate specific targeted threats, to where instead of investigating criminals, they're investigating citizens. They're investigating all of us. And that's a real problem because, you know, we fought a war to have protections, to have rights, like our Constitution, like our Fourth Amendment, that says not only can you not search our communications without a warrant, but you can't seize them in the first place. You can't create a giant database of all of our activities, of all of our communications, and then sort of go back in time and search them uh, just because you want to know what's going on with us. I, 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 think, I, I, go ahead. I think a point that, that you and I and others of our ilk need to make increasingly frequently is that in the unique case of the United States, National security means the security of our founding principles. It's not our borders, it's, which are you know, extremely vaporous and difficult to define at this stage. It's, it's not our culture, such as we have one beyond Mickey Mouse. It's not, it's not anything except those founding documents that we, we, we still profess to believe in. And if we are insecure in our beliefs and our willingness to protect and preserve those beliefs, that's a threat to national security. Right, it's the, the question of are we protecting the nation or are we protecting the state? And that's the very, nation That's a very good way of putting it, exactly. It reflects us, you know, our, our way of life, our shared values. And if we're, you know, destroying those values, if we're sort of trying to burn down the village in order to save it, are we really making progress? Is that what America's all about? You know, I don't think we should have to go around uh, before we send a text message or we carry a cell phone or we make a purchase or, you know, we, we say goodnight to somebody we love, uh, that we have to think about what that's going to look like in a government database tomorrow or a year from now or five years from now. And the fact that they've got data collection going back five years or more with a waiver uh, should be a concern to every American. Well, one of the things that people have a different, especially oddly enough in the, the intelligence agencies, uh, have a difficult time with is the difference between data and information. And you know this difference, it, it's a profound difference. Uh, data, data are simply facts about the phenomenal world. Information is something that has been deemed by a human mind to be relevant in a specific context, which gives it a living quality. 
Right. I mean, you can think about uh, one of the biggest debates we've seen over the last year in government circles has been about metadata. They've said, you know, metadata, all of this signaling information about where we go, who we met, you know, who we called, how long it took, you know, all the time we spend doing these different activities in our lives. Metadata is a comprehensive record of what we do and really who we are. And the defenders of sort of mass surveillance, the defenders of suspicionless surveillance have told us it's nothing to worry about, it's not that serious, because it's not the actual uh, words that we're speaking on the call. It's just everything else about our entire lives. But something that's amazing that's happened in this, this same year is that the government itself has started to abandon that. Michael Hayden, former director of the CIA and the NSA, literally admitted to a reporter, we kill people based on metadata. Yeah. That's it. You know, uh, that's, that's right. extraordinary. Stuart Baker, the former general counsel of the and, NSA, and an old he friend. said metadata tells you everything about a yeah. person, and he's right. Yeah. That's what people, you know, that's what we've all come to see, is if the government is collecting metadata without a warrant, they're collecting everything about everyone. And what does that mean for our society as we go forward? Well, it could, you know, it could mean nothing. Uh, well, it means something in any event, but it could mean relatively little as long as the judgments that are made about that information, uh, as long as the motivation for seeking certain kinds of information and winnowing that out of the data as opposed to other kinds is, is transparent and well understood by everybody who is being surveilled. I mean, for example, I, I took a walking tour of the Tenderloin the other day. Uh, and there were surveillance cameras everywhere. I didn't mind that. Uh, I didn't mind that there were there were uh, echo uh, there were there were microphones everywhere that could that could pick up the exact location of a gunshot immediately after it occurred. I could see the purpose in that. Uh, but the, by the same token, they were picking up a lot of other information that in hands different from the ones that they may be in now, could be very differently used. All right, so there, there is a distinction between things that are held in private hands and things that are held in public hands, uh, because when the government collects information on you, you know, the things they can do with it are extraordinary. Uh, I, again, yeah. getting back to Mike Hayden, uh, you know, he can kill you based on yes. it. You know, the, the government can put you in jail, they can curtail your rights, they can monitor you intrusively, uh, but, even though the private sector doesn't do as much today because they don't have the same authorities, uh, the powers and privileges that they're enjoying are expanding. There's very little regulation about the private collection of data um, because to, to a great extent, that's the business model of the current internet. But we really need to think about what we want to allow uh, the rules of play to be in society, not just for governments, but for everyone. Uh, and, you know, there's an organization um, of, of academics and specialists, experts on surveillance policies and human rights around the world who have been working uh, extensively on this. And last year they proposed something called the International uh, Principles on the Application of Human Rights to Communication Surveillance. And it's called the 13 Principles. And basically it boils down to any information that's collected and used uh, has to be used for purposes that are necessary and proportionate to sort of the case that we're encountering. Uh, in the government's uh, examples, it would be things like you can't monitor an entire country uh, because you're worried about a few criminals. Uh, that's not proportionate to the threat, and it's certainly not necessary. Um, for uh, companies, it would be similar things. If you are collecting information for advertising or for monetizing your service, you have to only collect that information which is absolutely necessary for those business purposes and only retain it for the bare minimum of time necessary to achieve those purposes. Not sort of collect these global profiles on everybody who uses your service, your email address books, who you talk to, how long you talk to, and things like that, because that's going beyond what's necessary, right? And it creates a dangerous situation that uh, academics have described as databases of ruin, where basically when you aggregate so much information about people, regardless of where it's at, whether the government's holding it, 
whether the telecommunications companies are holding it or whether advertisers are holding it, the temptation to abuse it is simply too great for anybody to resist over time. There's also, I, I, I don't know about you, but I, I, when I first got around computing, uh, I found that there was something seductive about an empty field in a database. <laughs> it was completely irrational, but I would, even though filling in that field was probably of no particular relevance, I would go to some trouble to make sure that that was smoothly filled in. And I think that you have an entire culture that does that. Uh, and now, you know, there, that culture has suddenly been given tools that make it trivially easy to do that in every instance. Uh, right, I mean, when we think about it from the, the technical perspective, you know, uh, technologists, engineers, we like to solve problems and we like to see how far the system goes. And we see we have access to data, we want to collect it because otherwise it's wasted, why not? Um, but something that uh, President Obama said over the last year when he was caught, for example, spying on Angela Merkel, was just because we can do something doesn't mean we should. And that applies to you know, all of these programs. Sometimes that field in the database needs to be left unfilled because the risk of filling it is far greater than the benefit of doing so. And that's something that worldwide we need to institute principles now, I, I, I'm in a, the way what's appropriate. I'm afraid we, we have descended to the point, you know, there's an old joke about why do animals lick their genitals? Uh, because they can. And, <laughs> Uh, we, we have reached the point where something very similar applies uh, to governments, except for the fact that they're not licking their own. Uh, they're licking ours. Yes. <laughs> which and then is, taking pictures. Which is wrong by anybody's standards. And, and, and we're not getting much from it. Uh, but that yeah. aside. <laughs> I, I think you're really onto something there, and the, the key is, you know, we're not getting a lot out of this. And, no. and regardless of whether it's you know, a joke or whether it's very serious, we've created these programs that are watching not just everybody in America, but they're watching everybody in the world. And we've seen, the government's had a year now to justify these programs. Uh, and we've seen things like they said, they stopped 54 terrorist attacks. Uh, and then they said, well, they weren't all attacks. Well, they weren't all you know, threats. Well, they didn't all happen. It was actually one attack, and that attack was defined as a cab driver in California sending $8,500 to his family in Somalia. Um, the question is, what did we do to make that possible? What did we give up in terms of our rights? And now we see these programs are not just affecting us on terms of our rights, on tops of our liberties, uh, sort of in the way we live as Americans, but it's actually affecting our economy. Yeah. You know, our tech sector Absolutely. is being devastated by the activities of the NSA, where they're reducing the trust in our products, they're reducing the trust in our government, in our country, uh, and citizens around the United States are losing trust in our institutions and our governments because officials keep lying about these programs. It started with James Clapper, and then it moved to Congress, and now it's officials across the board. And we need truth and reconciliation. We need the government to wash its hands of these programs. We need to end mass surveillance. We need to end the violation of our constitutional rights. And we need to create a better system that says security is not the only value that right. Americans treasure. Right. You know, we don't Absolutely. want to live in a security. In fact, in fact, my motto has always been safety third. Now, I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't expect everybody to go there, but... Uh, you know, I think but you've taken some, uh, some risks in your day. Yes, yeah. But the, the, the important consideration here, I think, is that, that we, have, we have allowed a, a system of defaults that have not been examined uh, in any way by the body politic. Uh, to, to become the defaults. There is, you know, it, it is simply thought uh, by certain sets of people that some things must be secret. Well, frankly, I think as somebody who, who occasionally tries to justify the operations of the intelligence community, uh, it would be greatly to their benefit if people knew exactly what they were like, exactly what they could do, exactly what they can't do, and exactly what they have a conscience about. I mean, they are endowed with, with uh, both 
capacities and evil intent in those capacities that is awe-inspiring but false. There's, there's certainly a line, right? Because where we don't need to know the names of every target, we don't need to know every intelligence operation out there, we need to know the broad outlines of the authorities that governments have granted themselves. And particularly yeah. when it comes to things like the most senior officials in our intelligence community lying under oath in, on camera to everybody in the country, that has a tremendous effect because suddenly we realize it's no longer a question of, you know, who do we trust, uh, who do we elect, who do we vote for, but can we elect anyone? You know, do they really represent our interests when officials can make promises about reforms and then violate those promises, violate that faith that the public invested them with in our votes and face no consequence, face no accountability. And this is one of the reasons that I think we see uh, these, these tremendous efforts being made today. I, I read just today uh, that Google has uh, rolled out a new end-to-end -end encryption plugin for Gmail as part of the Reset the Net campaign. And this is a key, right? The Reset the Net campaign is going, you know, we need legal reform. We need Congress to step up and reform these things. But we're past the point where citizens are entirely dependent on governments to defend our rights. We don't have to ask for our privacy. We can take it back. Yes. We can use our technology, apply it in new and innovative ways. To and this is what we had. To, this is a, what we had to do before, Ed. I mean, uh, back in the early days of EFF, uh, we were in similar uh, position with regard to the NSA. Uh, we had Jerry, uh, John Podesta, inviting Jerry Berman and me down to his office in the bottom of the White House, showing us a clipper chip and how that was going to, to fix everything. And, and I pointed out to him at the time, I said, look, you have an economy that is about to blow up in cyberspace that will not work unless it's a trusted economy, unless the circumstances in, in which it takes place have valid trusting relationships that people can enter into. And if you, if you do something to that, the consequence to your national security on an economic basis will be profound. I mentioned this to Mr. Park, the, the CTO, I guess he is, of the White House the other day, and he said, oh, well, we've been, we've been considering that. But, you know, they, they don't consider that until they're forced to. I mean, the only reason that the NSA allowed strong cryptography to be, to be uh, used freely was because EFF came in and proved that it was a form of speech and they were exercising prior restraint. But regrettably, that wouldn't work now because the Justice Department the other day, as you know, was revealed to have gone in on, on some very important cases and lied to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court is perfectly happy to maintain the decisions that it made while being lied to. But and nobody's saying anything. Right. You're, you're absolutely right on the broad point. And it wasn't just, you know, open courts, the open federal courts, the, the actual secret surveillance court, the one that never says no, that, uh, you know, when asked uh, 33,000 times or 34,000 times in 30 years uh, to say yes to the government only said no like 11 times. Uh, those guys actually found that the NSA had been abusing their authorities, their programs so badly, despite what the secret court told them to do, that they, they called them out in the judgment. And that wasn't declassified. You know, we didn't know about this, Congress didn't know about this, until after all of the last year's revelations. So what does that say about accountability when even our secret courts are being lied to? You know, and the question is, how do we move on from there? And we see the, the judiciaries, uh, they're emboldened, they're getting more courageous. Uh, just uh, a day or two ago, we had a, a new federal court in a case, uh, Smith v. Obama, that uh, ruled that, yes, well, you know, we can't declare this program unconstitutional right now, today, <laughs> because of a, uh, a Supreme Court decision from like 1978 that was terrible, uh, <laughs> that, that every legal expert says was completely wrong and needs to be revisited. But that same judge also said, I'm basically making this decision under duress. My hands are tied by the precedent, but the Supreme Court should overturn this using Judge Leon of a, another a Clayman v. Obama case uh, as the template for how to correct our laws, how to correct these old mistakes of policy that we've inherited 
that now 30 years down the road, you know, 30 years, five years down the road, uh, as technology has progressed in ways these justices, you know, never imagined, uh, have ended up basically uh, undermining not just the way we live, but our constitution as a document. Uh, and so we need this. We need judges to stand up and go, look, this isn't right. Anybody can read this and see it's not right. The NSA is playing games with Supreme Court precedent. They're interpreting laws away in secret without asking the public, without talking to the majority of Congress. And the only people that the public has to rely on, on as advocates are two intelligence committees that get twice as much in terms of donations than any other member of Congress that's not on these committees. And that's a problem, right? Our allegiances of, of these representatives aren't with us. Right. They're with the people who are working against us, the people who yeah. decided that instead of investigating criminals, they need to investigate us. This is, I mean, and this is the heart of national security, in my mind. If, if this fabric has become as frayed and rent uh, as it obviously has, then we have a real serious national security problem. Right. I mean, in, in terms of national security, we need to think about what makes us successful, what makes us strong as a country to begin with. The black budget that was published in the Washington Post last year showed that we're spending $75 billion a year on spying. Now, do we need to spend $75 billion a year on spying? That's more than we give to NASA. That's more than we give to the National Institute of Health. That's more than we give to the National Science Foundation. That's more than we give to the Department of Commerce. That's more than under some you know, measures, not all the time. We give to the Department of Education. You know, do we need to be able to innovate? Do we need to be able to succeed economically? Do we need to be able to educate our people? You know, do we need to be able to thrive and to build and to create? Or do we need to spy on what the German chancellor is doing? You know, to me, it's an open and shut question. Do we need to be collecting the communications of everybody in America, or do we need to be educating America? Well, but yes, exactly. <laughs> but, you know, Ed, one, a, a central point, and, and you must be extremely sensitive to this, are we beginning to get anything like our money's worth for that 70 billion? I mean, I can't think of a single major event, and I'm going all the way back to the, to the day that the Chinese crossed the Alu River. I cannot think of a single major event that the intelligence uh, uh, bodies of the United States called correctly, not one. Can you? You know, I, I think this, this is a tough one because there's obviously some value. You know, we, we can't say that no spying is good under no circumstances. Well, no, no, I'm just and, saying you know, that nobody's I, gonna be I haven't able, seen I, any I of it work. Did, but they're not going to be able to predict the future. At the same time, you're right, overall. The 9-11 Commission found that we already had all the information we needed to detect the plot. We didn't need more spying. We needed to be able to understand what was going on with the information we already had. But instead, what happened in the wake of 9-11? They created these secret programs of domestic surveillance, these sort of indiscriminate dragnet programs that pile more haystack on yeah. sort of this haystack yeah. of human lives uh, that we didn't understand in the first place. Does that help us or does that hurt us? Same thing with the last year. Again, we got this 54 plots thing where they're desperate to justify these programs. They're desperate to show we did good. But at the end of the day, under oath, you know, the director of NSA had to climb down and admit that no. You know, all we got was a cab driver wiring money to Somalia that we would have picked up anyway because the FBI was already uh, closing in on them under other authorities, traditional authorities. And if that's the case, right, if we can do this anyway, why do we need these programs? If they know enough about these people to target them under these programs, they can go to a judge, make their case, and get a warrant in their magical secret court. And we don't need to mess with these $75 billion programs that are not only destroying our rights, they're making us less safe because other people can get into the same back doors that we're building into these Cisco routers we're shipping overseas. It doesn't make sense. Well, it, it doesn't make sense. Uh, but on some level, it makes sense within itself. And, and and I think that the responsibility that people here have, and, and especially the responsibility that, that you have and that I have, is to try to get people to understand this senselessness in a way that actually reflects policy eventually. Because even the people who are in charge of the senselessness 
uh, are completely impotent in the face of it. I mean, I, I did some consulting to the Navy some years ago uh, before uh, a very good man, Admiral Mullins, was, was head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And he, one night over drinks, he said to me, uh, he said, you know, it, this strikes me as being something like the Crips versus the Bloods. And what have I got? An aircraft carrier. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a set of tools that are completely unequipped to anything that we could do. Uh, and, and we still have Trident missiles that are fully funded until 2043, cruising the oceans, waiting for that, for that first strike from someplace. Right, I mean. How we, do we, we stop, how do we stop the, the juggernaut, the Leviathan, the, the beast? So we need, to, we need to have a comprehensive, a comprehensive response to sort of the, the failure of institutions domestically, and not just domestically, but internationally. Yeah. Right? The reason government exists is to represent and champion the public interest. It seems pretty obvious to, I think, most people here uh, that there are a lot of corporate interests that are creeping in. There are a lot of political interests creeping in uh, to government agendas that don't represent public needs. And that's a concern because some people go, well, how do we respond? I'm going to vote with my dollars. You know, I'm going to donate to this group or the other group, and that's good. Right. But you can't stop. You can't wash your hands when you donate money to the ACLU or the EFF or any of these other groups, even though that's necessary. Because when it comes to a fight of dollars, right, uh, they have more than we do. Lockheed Martin has more money than you do. Boeing has more money than you do. Uh, you know, Booz Allen Hamilton has more money than you do. But they only get one vote the same as you do, right? So everybody here needs to remember that we have to vote. You know, we've got a congressional election this year, and we did not just vote, we need to campaign against people who aren't representing the public interest, because at the end of the day, their job is to represent us. And if they're not doing it, if they're representing Lockheed, if they're representing Boeing, they need to find a new job. One of, one of the things you're spared, though, Ed, is the palpable sense of despair that I feel here with regard to those elections. Uh, I, I mean, it was primary day before yesterday, and I'm, you know, in, in California, and I care very much about the, the processes of democracy. And John Gilmore, who I'm staying with at the moment, said, well, did you vote? And I laughed. I think it's the first time in my life that I ever laughed at that question. And the fact that I would laugh at that question is not a good sign. That, that's, that is a fair concern, right? Because we, we've all seen this. We've seen a number of elections now where, uh, you know, we've been promised one thing and we've gotten another. Uh, and the quality of the candidates that we're seeing, it seems like we have to choose between the lesser of two evils, right? It becomes this whole partisan red versus blue ticket thing and, you know, which right. team are you on? And that's not good for the country. Parties don't matter. Parties don't represent you. Parties don't represent our interests. Parties represent party interests. Uh, you know, we need citizens to run. We need people who aren't professional politicians. We need people who aren't, you know, uh, a part of the system uh, more broadly, who represent public interests, who represent our interests as a class of citizens. And we need to campaign for them. We need to vote for them, you know? And we have to make changes from the bottom up. From the bottom up. Where we basically up. go, yeah, the system is yeah. broken to yeah. a great extent. And I, it, we, it, we are disenfranchised. But if we don't step up and change the system ourselves, we're the ones who have to live with the consequences. It, it may well be that the place where it's broken most completely and, and possibly permanently is at the nation state level. You know, uh, we, I think, I said 20 years ago, and believe more wholeheartedly now that, that we're about to see the greatest renaissance of the city-state since the renaissance. Because the nation-state is exactly the wrong level of government to work well in, in a heavily informatized uh, age, where there is simply so much information coming in that it starts to fibrillate, as any natural system will if it has uh, connection shock. 
There is, a, there is something to be said for, I think, the ponderous nature of the nation state in the modern age when we're so well connected, uh, when our communication systems are, are so robust, uh, so capable. Do we really need sort of the, the massive sprawling super state to represent our interests? When you look broadly uh, at governance as a problem, governance as a challenge around the world, uh, small states, uh, small governments are typically uh, more representative of their populations. And I, I don't mean, yeah. you know, just in terms of the United States. I mean, you know, your county government, your city government, because you can access these officials. You can talk to them. You yeah. can make the case. And they don't have a tremendous amount of resources separating them from you through all these bureaucratic offices. So we do need more accessible government. We don't need sprawling government. We don't need these tremendous concentrations of power into a tiny amount of hands. It's the 99% versus the 1% problem, whether it's in business or whether it's in government. And I think we do need to take steps to address that. And the first step is talking about it. Yeah, and believing it. And, and, and the first step, really, frankly, Ed, is, is having, I wish there were more, but having somebody like you who is capable, willing, and smart enough, and clear enough to stand up and say, I have had enough, and I'm not going to take it anymore, and, and this is what's wrong with it, and this is why it has to stop. And, you know, I, I hate the fact that you are practically alone in this. We are doing our best to, to proliferate your kind, but I'm very grateful for the one that we've got. Very you know, I, I appreciate the compliments, but the reality is I didn't do anything special. It's critical to remember that. What I did was a civic duty, right? What I did was what all of us would do, I believe, in the same situation. If you are sitting at my desk and, you know, you see the massive systemic violation of our Constitution and the public doesn't know about it, you know, what would you do? It's, it's, it's a challenge, but we have to step up on a broad basis. We have to say, you know, I'm not special. I'm not, you know, this right. super genius. I'm not uh, particularly morally gifted versus the common man. This is about all of us. This You're is about brave. us standing up and saying what kind of country we want to live in. You're brave, though. And, and you're brave and you're not pretending to be asleep. You know, the, the, the Navajo have a wonderful saying, which is that you can't awaken somebody who's pretending to be asleep. And, <laughs> you know. And that, that describes that. a very large percentage of the uh, American public at the moment. Uh, they're playing possum. A, a lot of this comes down to the, the fact that we don't like to rock the boat about things we don't see affecting us personally. Um, and that's the reason that a lot of people don't go out and campaign against all of these you know, political problems, against all of these things that do affect us but in a way that they don't see directly because it hasn't hit them yet. The real problem is when you do that in terms of surveillance, when you do that in terms of mass surveillance, when you do that in terms of your constitutional and your human rights, these are rights that you often never get to claw back because once the government grants itself an authority, it's loath to give that up. Yeah. And when we give them a database of all of our human lives, all of our activities, who we love, what we think about, what we look up on Wikipedia, and we let them hold that forever and ever as, as time goes on, we let them build these massive data spanners to build these sort of domains of data about our domestic lives. Uh, we might trust this president, we might trust this Congress, we might think today's director of national intelligence is the most moral man in the universe. But what happens after the next election right. and the next election and the next election? It's a system of turnkey tyranny that we've allowed to be built. Well, actually, we didn't allow it to be built because we were never asked for our consent. But it has been built in secret, behind closed doors, and now we're living with it. The question is, what are you going to do about it? Yeah, and that is the question. And I'm, unfortunately, that is all we have time to ask is that question. Uh, but I hope that question will ring in everything we do here over the next couple of days, and, and in everything we do. I mean, United States of America, such as it exists, exists to ask that question and to answer it right. And, and 
God bless you, Ed Snowden, for helping us answer it. Thank you for, thank you for one second. So, If I, could, if I could just say one, one last thing, you know, when I, when I look over the last year, you know, I, I had to give up a lot to do what I did. Uh, and my biggest fear was that, you know, nobody would care, nobody would talk about this. Right. But this, this, the people in this room today, the conversation that we're having shows how wrong I am, how wrong I was. And, you know, I'm so thankful for that. I think it's critical because it shows the fact that we're not going to turn the page on massive systems violating the Constitution and things like that overnight. It never happens, right? Government doesn't turn the boat immediately. But the fact that we're talking about this, the fact that you are talking about this, the fact that people care shows that we will get a better and more accountable government. You know, And while all I did was I returned information to public hands that never should have been kept from the public in the first place. Yeah. It's up to you guys to end this conversation. And, you know, seeing this level of support just encourages me that you will. And I've got to thank you for that. When, as, and, and And, and speaking, speaking of support, uh, I think this is a, a good time to announce that a group of us have come together uh, and started the Courage Foundation uh, to support your legal defense. Uh, and uh, I, I encourage everybody in this room and, and far beyond these walls to donate to, uh, it, it, actually we, do, we can't, Receive donations under the, the uh, CourageFoundation.org yet, but FreeSnowden.is uh, can receive those donations, and they're re relatively easy to make. And uh, you know, we it's going to take a fair amount of money to deal with a case where the president of the United States is willing to scramble entire nation states in order to hijack an airplane. We're up against a lot, so. In, just on keeping with that, um, Edward, uh, we have your registration badge as the speaker right here. Yeah, we thought, you know. And, um, and so we're going to auction it off. John Perry has agreed to autograph it uh, this, right, as soon as we're done. And Edward, when I was speaking to him earlier, has agreed that when he comes back to the United States, he'll autograph it too. But not, so not before. The, so oh, whoever win, the donation for the winning of this badge will go to freesnowden.is. Uh, and we're going to do the auction on Twitter. It's going to, I'll take a picture of it. I'll put it up on, uh, on the feed uh, in a minute. And it's going to run till uh, 5 o'clock today. And the winning bid at 5 o'clock gets this badge. And you'll get a chance to meet Edward Snowden when we can welcome him back into the United States. Is that OK with you? <laughs> and one last thing for the, the people who don't, uh, don't have a lot of money, who, who can't participate in auctions, who can't donate, just remember the reset the net thing that we're, that's happening today is important because it protects not just you, it's herd immunity for everybody that you're talking to. And it doesn't cost a thing to participate. Thanks. Edward, thanks for joining us. Yeah. Thank you. See you soon.